So I just read these two great books, and I don't toss that word around. Amazing books that we're going to talk about today and hopefully have a lively conversation. Directing Great Television by Dan Adias and Directing Actors by Judith Weston. And I just have to say, I've been doing this for a long time, and I got so much from these books. I got an enormous amount from both of them. Um, your book, Dan, what I loved about your book is that it's tightly focused. It's not directing mediocre television. It's not directing <laughs> movies. It's not directing plays. It's directing great television like Homeland and The Sopranos and, and uh, uh, stuff of that nature. So I think for those of us who want to be involved at that level of work, whether you're a civilian or whether you're in the industry itself, it's a really great eye and, and into what that's like from the inside, from people who are creating that with your task in particular. And your book, Judith, is a incredibly detailed book about this creative dance between actors and directors, which I just got, I cannot tell you how much I got from it. And, and hopefully I'm not too old to continue to learn stuff, but I learned a lot from it. And, and just the way it is, just the way the process is explored and what I got from both of you is a passionate interest in story, in the storytelling. And that is kind of the, you use this term a lot in your book, the true north or magnetic north. And that is what it has to be. And sometimes we're more interested in the job, the career, but these books are about the passionate interest in storytelling. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. You both spoke about acting training for directors. and. I can say, in my, in my instance, the half a dozen or so really great directors I've worked with all had that training or were actors themselves, and it, it is a different experience. And so I know you trained and worked as a professional actor, and I know you trained as an actor, but you decided directing was your thing That's right. early on. So I'd just like you to briefly just talk about that, because that, to me that's an important thing. Well, I started acting myself, not to be an actor either, but to be a human being. I was, it was the early 70s and I'd gotten to Oakland, California, the Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and um, I sort of felt like I didn't know who I was. And I was, you know, a lot of people were looking for actualization in that time. And I ran into a friend of mine from New York who said, look, I'm taking this incredible class. You've got to come see it. This teacher, she's amazing. So I just thought uh, and it happened to be an acting class. So I went and um, I just felt like I, you know, stepped into where I needed to be. And I, I was a fairly fragmented person and I, I just felt like I was being able to integrate parts of myself by playing these different roles. And, um, and just giving myself to them completely. So when I started teaching, which was a number of years later, I started teaching something that I called acting for non-actors because I thought it's just so such a valuable thing for anybody to do. And then I started teaching acting for directors. So that was, that was a big, big part what was to give directors a place where they could take a three-day class and... Uh, and just you know, not be afraid that they were you know going to have to come every week for forever, but to give them a deep immersion, uh, safe, safe and deep immersion in the acting process. And they told me that they came out of it a different person, and that they came out of it with a different understanding of uh, of actors. So I've just always believed in that. That's how I got started. That's how I got invited to write my book. Mm about six years later was because I had had some success with this with this class. And what about you, sir? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'm intrigued by, by your answer that you started acting. I think you said to be a human being, or didn't you? Yeah. yeah to me, I was think, reflecting on that, I think that's really what I'm still doing. And then that was one of the original motivations as well, to explore my own humanity and to explore human experience. And that's what I feel is the only thing really worth much in any project I approach is, is it going to contribute greater understanding or experience or the sense of being alive or having lived 
finding, penetrating to a deeper layer of truth that gets through the veils of familiarity and persona and defenses and all that to something deeper and truer. Mostly because I felt frustrated myself in my self-protection and defenses and fears and things that kept me from what I wanted, what I felt what would, have, would be a full experience of myself. That led to acting class. I just took, uh, it was after I graduated with a degree in English and had gotten accepted to law school and just knew that's really not what I want to do. And just to kind of really free myself from these constrictions I felt so bound by, I gravitated to acting in order to play, which was not something that was easy for me. Frankly, I became aware too of how much I, I treated my life as a performance which was being judged. So almost coming to acting was a way to break free from that performance and finding an ability uh, uh, facility at, at playing. And through that, I said, wow, what could I make a life of this? Because I loved the experience of just being free of the constraints, because it's make-believe. You know, there's nothing really at stake. And there's something so marvelous about that. And I, I came alive in many real ways. But I will say that while I had, uh, I think, a pretty good ability to kind of explore intellectually what was going on and feel my way into the heart of the scene, the actual part of being judged at this moment, like what is my inner life and is it real and is it authentic and getting rid of that critic over my shoulder saying, You're a f this, that's fraudulent, that's not real, that, you know, and, and then not getting hijacked by that voice and having to come back to the imaginary circumstances was so difficult, so torturous for me that when it clicked, it was great. When it wasn't, I felt like a complete fake. And uh, you know, some people would perceive it, some people wouldn't, oh, that was great, no, but I knew it wasn't. But it was very painful. And it wasn't until I wound up uh, applying to graduate school in critical studies on film at UCLA, really only so I could take the acting workshops. But as a part of that, I had to make, I had to make a short film. Uh, because, well, if you're gonna write about film, you should know what it's like. And that was the epiphany because what I realized is once I was behind the camera and wasn't so on the line in the moment, you know, all of my, you know, worries about that, it's like, you know, I was so much able, more able to get out of my own way. And I was so much a better actor directing actors. Because when I, there was something to me about, I'm not being evaluated for this, I'm giving it to you. And let me, let me share what I think is going on. And it was almost, and, and I developed an approach instinctively that I still use. It's almost, there are times it's almost osmosis. I'll, I'll often find myself embodying the very energy I'm trying energetically to communicate to an mm. actor so that they, and that, so that I know, we're, and I love that intimacy. But I always, you know, I have that safety. I can step back at any time. Oh, this isn't me, this is you. This is what you're gonna do. Now let me see what you do with it. So what, for whatever psychological, reasons that's that's easier for me and I I so love the intimacy of it that, that reminds me how how I felt when I started teaching you know because I was uh, when I was doing stage in the Bay Area I was completely uninhibited I would do anything without worrying and, and if I had a bad performance just write it off and uh, but then when I got to LA it was completely different you know going from being a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond I didn't make that transition well. And I, w I was terrified whenever I went into offices. I, w I, was, I wasn't afraid of work, but I was afraid of offices. <laughs> and, wow. You know, I wish I'd had your book when I got, when I got Me here. Me too, in, in, uh, <laughs> by the way. You know, in, in 1979. And um, when I finally moved to, to teaching, um, I felt, again, that total freedom yeah, let me just share with you, and I try to touch on this in my book too, uh, because one of the things that I don't, I, I haven't read a lot of the literature about, I've read Sidney Lumet's book, which is great, but I haven't really read uh, much about this. But one of the, what I gather, because when I hear people talk about directing, I, I, there's big gaps that aren't talked about. And when I was writing my book and trying to figure out, well, what do I have to say, which really involved, by the way, deconstructing my process because I've had a long career directing. I didn't start out thinking I was gonna write a book about it. But when I did start being invited to speak at, at some conferences and, and then forming a mentoring group, and I realized I started to deconstruct my process. Well, what is it exactly I do? Well, I do this. I, you know, I respond to what I don't know. I, you know, I, I open myself to not knowing. I ask questions, I, and I uh, arrive uh, hopefully at a state of 
of um, almost a meditative state of kind of seeing what arises because it's like, you know, if you already know the answers, you're not going to be filled with anything very interesting. But I, I addressed a lot of questions of what are the inner states one has to deal with, and directing in particular, and I'm sure it's, it applies to almost anything, that when you're challenged, uh, how can you find that still place, that still center within? How can you find that place where you're just open to what's, what's going to arise? I find I'm so grateful for the opportunity to direct because in many ways I feel it's like where I'm most alive in my life because I've gotten out of my own way, because I'm serving something other than my ego or, you know, worry about how I'm being perceived. I'm serving story. And that's something that I, genu I genuinely want to take a deeper dive into because I want to learn something. I want to see something true emerge that's, that's, oh, I see what's really happening because something isn't quite happening. So that when I watch a rehearsal, for example, it's like I'm constantly monitoring myself. To me, you know, the fundamental directing question for me is, how does this make me feel? That's the because I'm my, I'm my only barometer, right. and it's like it's not figuring out so much. There is a lot of figuring out to do and all that. And you write brilliantly about it in your book about when you break down a script, you have certain things you gotta gotta you gotta determine, get to determine, get to determine. Yeah, very good. Um, but for me, when I'm watching a rehearsal and actors, I'm just noticing my own inner response to what's going on. I'll have an idea about how the scene ought to work, of course. But I'm also try to keep that in one compartment of my brain and in another compartment, just see what they're giving me, see where I'm interested, where I'm not interested, where my attention flags. And, and only by noticing that do I know where there's deeper digging that's required. So in a way, what I so love about directing, and I tried to communicate this in the book a bit, is that it requires total presence if you're going to do it well. And, and you can't be, I, I don't pretend to be fully present for the full duration of a job. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I respond to all the pressures everybody else does, but I, I hope I've developed some techniques, which I hope, to, you know, I hope I've shared effectively in the book. I, I think the key for me is like, is what master are we serving? And it's like, it's my, it's my one chance to land this moment in this story with these actors, this place. And it's like when you hold that as your awareness of that, it somehow makes the other stuff go away, you know. And I really want to see what's true here, and and my focus uh, gets gets sharpened because of that concern. You know, clearly we're all still. I'm I'm certainly still motivated by things that I'm not proud of and all that. I get I could respond to stresses. I want to be a success. I want my work to be loved. All that stuff. But you can't lead with that. You know, there's got to be a deeper drive. That really motivates us, and I think that's the you know that's the drive of being an artist, of wanting to birth something, make something that brings something into existence. If it's only clarity or a depth of understanding, let that surface. I want that. That's when I I feel joy when I see a great performance take shape. You know when I hopefully helped by creating the conditions for an actor to feel fully supported, and perhaps thinking about something in a slightly different way that maybe I've helped him or her with but not because I know exactly what they're going to come up with. I want to see then what they bring. Because you know when something is real and authentic. We just know. And uh, there's, there's fewer, few greater pleasures in life than watching that process. You, you brought up something that I want to touch upon because we've talked about this prior to our meeting today, and that's rehearsing. And I do know that the, I trained in the theater. I, I worked in the theater professionally for a dozen years and, and did a lot of that at a fairly high level. And so I was very used to rehearsing. I was very used to having a lot of time to dig in and, and, and set the performance. And then I got here and it was like a scratch on the record. It was like, what? And the first few things I did, I was dreadful. I was really bad. I went, oh, I have a lot to learn. This is not the same thing. And the lack of rehearsal was the first big problem that I had. So, you know, actors pull themselves, each other aside and say, hey, let's go over this scene. And or you do it in the makeup trailer or you do it, you know, over, you know, if, are you done with lunch? Let's, let's run that scene. And so it's haphazard. And I know both of you talked about um, trying to memorialize that into what we do and having that be a thing. And it's I, the only time I've ever, I, I did early on, I did a mini series very early on with Delbert Mann, who no one probably remembers today, but he was, yeah, great, great director. And he re would rehearse, and you talked about this a little bit in Friday, in your 
discussion about Friday Night Lights. He would rehearse us pretty um, thoroughly without anybody there. And you figure out where you're going to move, what, where, what the shape of the scene is physically and in other ways. And then he would bring in all the technical people and say, okay, this is what we're going to light. This is what, the way we're going to shoot it. I've never had that experience before or since. I know we all want there to be rehearsal in film and television, but there generally isn't much. You know, the terrible fear that directors have about actors and about rehearsing and about being able to give notes, it, a lot of it has to do with not having done it. You know, you do it so rarely. It's so, you know, the directing jobs come up rarely, not for Dan, Dan works all the time, but for most, for, for a lot of directors, the directing jobs come up rarely. And, um, and, and you have to practice. So what I tell people is to, if they can find a, a, a class, I used to teach classes where directors practiced working with actors, but I don't have the workshop space anymore. But, but if, you, if you can find a class, great. If you can't, then set something up yourself. Create your own atelier. Uh, find actors. Actors love to work out. Find act, start with your friends and then ask them to invite their friends and, and um, uh, practice rehearsing a scene a week. You know, start with a... Such a great idea. Start with a one page, two, two people, and, and just practice rehearsing it and take two full hours. Now, I know you're never going to get full, two full hours to rehearse on a set for a television or, or movie, ever. But... The idea is, it's like, let's say you wake up one day and you decide, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, run the Boston Marathon in April. So I'm going to start getting ready. Would you the next day run 26 miles? No. You would run one mile or two miles, and then you know, you'd build it up. It, this would be a good time to start because it's the end of January and the, the Boston Marathon's in April. But... But you would work up to it. You would work up to running 26 miles at a time gradually, and it's sort of the opposite for directing. You learn how to direct a scene in two hours, and then you give yourself one hour after after you feel comfortable with that. Give yourself one hour, then a half hour, and you've got to get down to 10 or 15 minutes. When I uh, hear you talking, it sounds almost like you're developing the muscle for doing it. Yes, and, exactly. And I realize that's something that kind of just happened naturally with me because I had so many opportunities to do that. Right. My, my uh, response is uh, to agree that, you know, in t particularly in television, um, and I directed one feature, it was my first job, and I was an assistant director on several of them. And, and th there you do have more opportunity for a rehearsal, and often in pre-production you'll be rehearsing. But in television, my, most of my work, where most of my work is, you really don't. You have about 15 minutes normally to rehearse it to the point where the blocking is set so the light, lighting can commence. And then you're actually, I'll talk about that in a minute, but you are, you know, the, the early takes, the, for me, the master angle is in many ways a significant rehearsal. You know, I'm trying to get the beats down once we start filming. And there's also a real concern I have, and I think that there's, funnily enough, when we're talking about there's not enough time, you can also over-rehearse. I mean, there's nothing more galling to me when I get a great performance and I haven't been filming it. So often I'll try to do, I'll ask permission. I say, do you guys mind if we shoot the rehearsal? Because, you know, yeah. it's like once we lit, because, you know, oh, perfect. Now let's do it with film. And, you know, and, and also the, the difficulty also, because film is so, it's different from stage and a different kind of acting. I mean, the principles are the same. You still want to reach a level of authenticity and all that. But there's a certain kind of lightning in a bottle quality in a film set. But there's, there's a more, the expectations I think people approach are more for more, life really happening as opposed to, I mean, in theater, I think my sense of it is that there's much more of a relationship between the actor and the audience, kind of like, are you with me still? Yes, I'm gonna, now I'm going to do this. And because there's a way in which the, in some ways, I think the imaginations of the audience in theater are more activated than in television or film, because in television or film, you just washed over everything. Do I believe that or not? It's like you don't, and you're not really affecting the actors because they're on film. Whereas in, in theater, there, you're, there's a real human being there you know, this really isn't ancient Rome. I know there's a pillar on the stage there, but this is really just a, you know, a, a, the, where the air conditioning is out and so all these things. So I'm, it's an act of my imagination to agree. I'm agreeing to believe that this is ancient Rome. Okay, now, and so there's so it's a different kind of acting, and and 
And some actors really want to save things, don't want to rehearse, but this is getting a little far afield. Let me just try to say what my approach is. Preparation, the director's preparation is enormously important. I have to know yes. what the scene is about, what, what, where it fits in the overall, overall story being told, what, has to, what, what the audience needs to emerge with after, this, after watching this scene. How are they, are they being prepared for something that's gonna happen two scenes later? Are they seeing the payoff that something that happened three scenes before? I have all these things in mind that I know how the story has to work and what this particular moment is. And I find that directing in television is so challenging because it has to be so focused. At the same time, this is why it's a challenging job. It's simply a difficult job because you want the actors to be relaxed. You don't want them that you want, and you also, I also want them to feel like they've found most of the moments and they found the stage. Bravo, yeah. Even though I have, for the most part, I have a staging in mind. I, mean, I always will have a staging in mind because you never know when the time is up, we have no time to rehearse, the actor, what do you want us? And you said, to, well, let's try this. You have to have that in your pocket so you know. And I've thought of that staging in connection with the story I'm being, that's being told and what is the conflict and how it could be physicalized, that conflict. And how, if you turn down the sound and watch the scene, would you still understand it? And how could the physical actions actually assist the actors in finding the emotional beats? You know, if they don't want to f face your question, that might be the time to turn around to kind of open a bottle of some water to drink to see if you could get a moment to come back. You know, it's like little things like that that will assist them finding the emotional reality. So I'll have a staging in mind, but I'll also try always to, you know, let's just run the lines first so everybody gets to hear them. And let's just see what you want to do. And I'll sometimes, you know, stand where I want the camera to be. This is just because actors will tend to want to show me what they're doing. So it's like, or take out a wall that I know I don't, and, and so they know they have three, so they're, they're, they start to sense what wants to happen. But ideally they're finding it. And ideally I'm saying, great, and I'm supporting them. So not, not, if, if for only that they're going to be more fully invested and open to more of their own instincts coming out. You know, it's not just finding the staging, it's also trusting themselves and, and being able to go deeper themselves because they do trust themselves. But that's a really, uh, so, so, the, so it's this funny thing of controlling but not wanting to control. And, and, I, and you have to develop an in, in, in ability to be concise, give an actable note. That's where having acting experience really helps. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, when you have a writer on the set who's saying, well, it's kind of about this, but it's also <laughs> this. And you know, also, it's like, it's not actable. And you see an actor's eyes glaze over. You can't play more than, you know, you could argue you can't really play more than one thing. That one thing could be complicated and nuanced, right. but you can't play 12 things. And uh, so the way you communicate with an actor in rehearsal is really significant, as is giving a note. And, uh, you know, you have to, you know, to me, it's just making sure I have connection with the person and just saying one word and making sure I'm heard and they heard. And so it's developing a relationship. But the rehearsal part, I think, I'm being a little long-winded, but let me just say, I think that the main thing is to know the story you're telling. Let the act, communicate to the actors that they know, that you, they feel they can trust you that you're telling the story, that you're going to give them an honest response to what they're doing, and that you're and that you're loving, <laughs> and that you love them, you know, and that they can't screw up, you know, but they can, you know, but you're going to give them an honest response. You both also talk about this is going to dovetail into that a little bit, uh, and I have a personal story or two about this as well. Is the Improv as a tool. Mm -hmm. I certainly use that when I coach actors. We we do that in class sometimes, and it's particularly for film and television work. It's finding that moment before the scene starts, so that you're coming into the scene at 50 miles an hour and not. Yeah, Judith writes beautifully. About beautifully it. about it, exactly. And I did this um, a couple of years ago. I did a guest star in Big Little Lies, and I relayed this to Judith on the phone and. David Kelly show, so you think, well, I can't change a word because it's a David Kelly show or a Stephen Bochco show or any of the kind of elite writers. And no, it was like, improv your way into the scene. They let us do, they encourage that and so that you've hit the scene fully formed and, and the first AD said, the director doesn't say action, the director won't say cut. She'll just say, once, you're, once you've talked your way into the moment, She'll say something like, off you go, which is what she did. 
and it was just it fit, was so freeing and whether you feel you can be fully participating and not like oh i have to hit this mark and i have to be great and you know all that stuff you talked about the devil on your shoulder that tells you these things when you have that freedom so i'd like you because you did talk about it beautifully in your book and i'd like you to talk about it now well i just wanted it this dovetails with what dan said about over rehearsing and definitely a two-hour rehearsal would be a terrible idea if all, if all they do is say the lines over and over again. A two-hour rehearsal, you don't get anything unless most of it is improv. And, uh, you, you know, I, 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 because if you just say, I mean, that's what people think rehearsal is, is just saying the lines over and over again. And it comes from the origin of the word, uh, repetition, and it comes from the origin of the idea of rehearsal, which is ballet and symphony and, and theater before movies were invented. And, uh, you know, repetition, repetition until, and, and ideally until you're not thinking anymore and it's, you know, it's all automatic, but, and, and then you can really be in the moment. But, um, but for, for film rehearsal, repetition of the lines is, is a terrible idea. Deadly. Deadly. And, uh, you know, trying different things, trying it wrong, um, talk, you know, uh, telling stories, asking questions, uh, and, uh, and doing improv, improvising things. And, and the, the, improv, the, pre, the, the improv of the moment before is one of the most valuable. Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing about improv, and I, I don't always use that. In fact, I don't often use that because in the television schedule, really, yeah. you, first of all, you know you're not going to change the lines. You might, you know, so you can spend a little time with it. But the beauty of improv is that you have to be completely connected to your scene partner because you don't know what's coming next. Exactly. And that's really what we're going for anyway in any scene. So what I, and, and just thinking about it, one of the ways I hope to accomplish the same thing is if I see an actor, if you feel, if you hear a performance that sounds rote, you know it. You can't fake connection very well. And, and it's just, and when an actor is doing everything the same way every time, no matter what their scene partner is, you know you have a problem. Yeah. And, uh, or at least you hope the director knows he or she has a problem because cause you've lost your audience. It's yeah. just, yeah, you hear that, I, yeah, I know what's happening, but I'm not involved. So uh, the way I'll do it, sometimes, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come in and I'll try to, I'll do whatever I can think of to, to connect them to each other. And that often might involve changing the intention. Okay, I want you to come into the scene with this intention. I want, you to, I want you to affect this person in this way and really know to figure if it's working or not. You know, and, it may, and, it, and maybe it's complete, and I want to pick something probably very different from what they've been working with, just to shake them out of it. Because I, you know, I've had to work with, I've been fortunate to get to work with you know, some incredible actors, some of the best working, but I, you also get sometimes inexperienced actors and all that, so how do I find a way to make them break free of just, wait, my line is this, did I say it right? And is it, you know, how do I get them to exist in the circumstances? And then there are a lot of ways and techniques that you have. And I'll say, you know, I'll just mention, you know, it, it involves reading the person in front of you also. It's like, you know, what's gonna affect this person? You know, I remember one very, and I, wrote, I mentioned this in the book, but one very inexperienced actor who was just floundering and he had an attack of terrible, you know, self, no self-worth and he was supposed to come in and be the life of the party and he was getting worse and worse and he was and I and I remembered he was had been a professional athlete and had been and had been a, a, a draft choice in the NBA and I just said I said you know remember that night you got drafted you know to play basketball and you went out celebrating you know you remember that night how did that feel how you felt well, this is that night this is you and so suddenly something about himself which was truly impressive he, oh yeah that is me Oh, okay. You know, it's like, so you have to just, whatever avails itself, just whatever will work, but it has to be, stay relevant to the story you're, being tell, you're telling. Well, I love one thing that just blew my mind about, I mean, I kind of tell people that Dan and I read each other's books at the same time. I had, uh, uh, I was given an advanced copy of his book to write a blurb for it. And, and I was given yours to thank you for writing a blurb about mine, <laughs> right, so maybe right, right. I could write one for you. But while I was right. while I, I was reading your book, I thought for sure you'd read the original Directing Actors, which was re I, I wrote Directing Actors in 1996. That's the original one, and the one that everybody should get now 
is the 25th anniversary, which came out last April. But, uh, but I thought, sure, that you had read the original Directing Actor. I felt we were just it. soulmates. It just, and it turned out exactly. you hadn't. No. No, at all. And of course, I hadn't. I was reading your book before my book came out. I mean, after my book came out. I was reading your book after my book came out. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to sound like I just, uh, you know, like I, I cribbed from him. You know, it's going to sound <laughs> like I plagiarized from him because there was so much overlap, so much. Incredible. Yeah. So much that was completely in sync. And one of the things was the use of opposites, where you talked about, you know, some of your getting, the way you get ideas for difficult scenes was very often to look at the opposite of what most people would have thought the scene, the way the scene well, just open should have been played. Open oneself to what some other po different ways of thinking about this. Yeah. yeah. So that like, for example, this isn't an acting, well, it kind of was, but I did a whole chapter on an episode of Homeland I directed where an ep it's like it was supposed to, the, the, the writers had a, in mind how a certain climactic moment was supposed to work. And, uh, and this was not a stunt sequence. This is not one of the big, it was simply a moment between two sisters and a custody battle. And it just wasn't working for me. And I got to the point of just, you know, just not being able to give, uh, you know, not being, I, I knew how the writers said it worked. They said, this is where the transition happens. She says this and she feels that. And it just didn't work. And it's like, I just really said, how, how else might I think about this? And what it really involved, and this is something I really hope to stress in my book, is it involved reimagining what was the story being told. Yes. It's like, you know, people confuse, you know, there's not sufficient awareness among too many people of, of what story is. It's like, it's not what happens. It's the meaning of what happens. It's the significance of what happens. It's what are the stakes that you as the director or as the actor have great power to influence. I love the sentence that you had. The script is not the story. Yeah, that's true. It's, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to offend writers, but I said, you know, in many ways, it's a fleshless blueprint. You know, you can't just film the script. That would be pictures of words on a page. Right, right. And, and so that in this particular instance, you know, I, I, in this Homeland episode, at the end of the day, and I'm sorry, actually, when I did the audiobook just recently, I realized I wish I had driven this point home more. What I really did to solve the story, to solve the acting problem, was to rewrite the story, which was not about custody. It was about the rapprochement of two sisters. Well, but you rewrote the subtext. Rewrote the subtext. You didn't. Which was you another didn't, phrase you didn't which blew me away. Was in your book, and I had a I whole chapter called that. I know. So yeah. But it, yeah. it didn't involve changing a line of dialogue. Right. And that came from not. Uh, it, I had a desire to change the dialogue, but here, as you know, as an episodic, as a series director, you're limited. You know, the, yeah. the writer is king, the showrunner is king or queen, and you know, and you have to accept givens. You can there's give and take, and I've had many instances where things have been altered because I saw them a little differently and was able to be persuasive about it. But in this instance and a few others I write about, no, nope, the writers wanted a certain way, so I had to make make it work. But then how you do that is, you, you, it's more within your power than you might first think. And I think this is really true of actors too, because I realized in all those chapters I was writing, it's like, well, I, I wound up giving one actor a, an entirely different way of thinking of the scene and, for, and I brought them along and they bought into it and found it. But there are a million times I've been blown away by actors coming in and having done that preparation in advance, having made sense of a scene Far, it's like you know. I've been pre reading the script all through prep, prepping it, and all that, and suddenly someone comes in and illuminates something deeper yeah. that I had never thought about, and mm -hmm. and that's the exciting thing, you know. That, that's one thing that I I often say to my clients. You know, I'm asking you to do this work, this script analysis preparation, not because you're going to tell so and so excellent actor how to how to do their how to play their role. A lot of times, it's so that you can keep up with them. Well, I think you wrote something, I, I believe it was in your book, isn't it? That you, something I loved about an actor can, should have a secret about their character. Yes. That no one has to know. It's not even going to be, you know, in the story, but somehow, you know, that character's reaction at that moment is going to be unexpected, unpredictable, not just about the one thing of this story. It can touch on a whole backstory that they never have to share, but it feels like a real human being. I think the example, correct me if I'm wrong, the example you used was Meryl Streep in Kramer yes. versus Kramer, yes. that her secret was she never really loved him. She never loved him. Which is just absolutely yeah. brilliant. When you, when you look at it 
in retrospect with that in mind, it's like, oh, yeah. what a fantastic tool, right? Yeah. 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 You also both, uh, you touched on quite a bit, Judith, about asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a question-asking household, as I told <laughs> you. I, I grew up in a Jewish household. My father would never say, what did you learn today? He'd say, did you ask a good question today? Lucky you. Lucky me. So, yeah, it is. So I, I come from that background, but it is... It is so important, and I find like when I, if I coach an actor for an audition, I just coached somebody yesterday on, on a really simple, short audition. Those are harder, frankly, oh, than, yeah. than the eight, gotcha. nine pages. It was like two and a half pages, and so we really had to ask, what's actually going on here? What, and it went, then there was very little help. She was given very little other than these two and a half pages, so there's all kinds of questions that there are no answers to, really. Sometimes that's the case. And so I said, well, we're just going to have to do some educated guessing and hoping that we land on something that's compelling and interesting, which is, I think, what we did. But asking the questions, everything follows from that for me anyway. Can I just, uh, you brought up something else in my mind that I think characterizes good actors. It's a little off subject, but it's, it's similar, which is like, like you said, okay, two, you had two and a half pages. How do you pop without pushing, right? I mean, how do you like make an impression without like, this is really, I'm doing this now, right? You know, <laughs> and how do you, and it's like, and I've often noticed that, you know, the best actors, the best performances are the ones where the actor, you know, allows you to come to them. They're not like reaching out and saying, watch me, look at me, you know, and that takes a lot of self possession. And it takes a lot of connection to an inner life. It takes time to learn how to do that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. But I think I think what it it, it it might go to that same question we just discussed about having a secret, you know. Mm -hmm. But if something, if somebody is holding on, if somebody knows, you know, they're not asking for a response, but they're fully involved with their own desires, needs, wounds, you know, there's something you, you, as an audience, you just kind of want, you just, you find it compelling as opposed to someone who's leading with that. I'm really wounded. I'm really good. Well, it comes down to uh, the problem of, of actors uh, trying to do it right. That's where they get into terrible, terrible trouble if they're trying to do it right. And when they're preparing for an audition, if they're trying to figure out what is wanted, you know, what, what, do, what, they want? what do they want? And yeah, you talk and about that's and that about goes that. to what intention you're entering the scene with. Are you entering the scene with an intention that's character based? Or are you entering the yes. scene with the intention of impressing? Yeah. Or the intention yeah. of doing it right? Or the intention? All of those things take you away from the real moment. And that's the same thing, you know. Getting off acting for just a moment, it's like, and I, I, I write about this too, like in a chapter on the language of camera. It's like, you know, everything needs to serve story. Every choice you make has to serve story. When it's serving boy, I want to do a really impressive shot. It's nice to have impressive shots. I want my shows to be visually stimulating and interesting, but only if they serve story. And if I get distracted by thinking, I can't just have the camera simply photographing this thing and just, it's not going to, people are going to be bored. Well, not if you, not if you, the characters are compelling. And if the characters are compelling, this is a scene that doesn't want a lot of histrionics and all that. It's like, I don't want to be distracted by a circular camera going around and around Michael and Judith and Dan as we're having this conversation. Wow, that's a great, that's, that's really, you know, got flair. Yeah, but what did they say? What were they talking about? You know, it's like you, you need to really, you know, and, and the camera for me is always, it, it's great when it assists in helping to create the subjective state I want the audience in best to receive the story. It might be I want them exhilarated. I want them on the edge of their seat. I want them. And then you start to work like that. Or I want a beautiful frame. Sometimes a beautiful frame takes away from the story. Well, somebody told me recently that the best sound bite from my, from my book is a good question is better than a bullshit answer. <laughs> good. And to, to the, you referenced something in my book as well. I, I often say, don't worry about what they want. What do you want? Yeah. What does your character want? And the emphasis on question is a great one, too, because it keeps you alive. It doesn't end things. It keeps it open. So, so you're still in process. You're still engaged. You're still activated. Sometimes an answer ends. Oh, okay, that's that. When you're casting, and you um, are actively involved in casting, I'm involved in casting as an actor and also as, uh, as a coach, I wish there was a better system. 
you talk about this. Uh, your book is so up to date. The fact that it's the 25th anniversary, it's like it was written yesterday, because there's stuff about Zoom and there's stuff about. Yeah, it's getting worse as a system when there's all this. Well, it is. It's, and it's, taped auditions. And it's a very no impersonal system, yeah. and you don't get an adjustment, so you have to just sort of take your best shot and hope something about you is, is interesting and compelling. But that, from the acting standpoint, particularly now, I mean, the nightmare scenario is you get a call, it's nine pages, it has to be due tomorrow at noon, you have to shoot it yourself, you have to, uh, you have a work shift that night, let's say, you're working in a restaurant or whatever it may be, and it's, it's become kind of impossible. It's a system where actors, it's very hard to do great work under those circumstances. And so in your, in your role as a director, when you are casting, I'm assuming you're casting now from tapes, Mostly. Yeah, mostly. So just talk about that a little bit, because not only the result of it, but the process. I just gave you a tiny bit of what the process of it is for the actor who, whenever I get an audition, I freak out. I go, oh, God, when does it do? Oh, Jesus. Because it's, it's different if you're 21 years old and you're a digital native and you know how to do this stuff and you've been putting yourself on camera since you were 12. Right. For someone of my generation, it's a little different story. So... Talk about that, if you can, like what it is you see, what's the deciding factor for you, if you can even articulate that. I'm just feeling so much compassion for what actors have to go through. I'm serious. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's sad. It, it seems to me, you know, because I came up like you, when you in the era when you went into offices right. and you either, I, I always used to enjoy auditions. I used to enjoy auditions too, where I got to actually know a person energetically, yeah. give them an adjustment, yeah. see if we connected, yeah. see if they, yeah, and see if there's a there there. I, I mean, I, I used to come, go in and there'd be six or seven people and they'd all look bored. You know, it was afternoon and they'd been watching, you know, and, and then I would just say, oh, those poor people, I'm going to cheer them up. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake them up. I'm going to make them feel glad they're here. So it, that always fed me, actually, rather than, than frightened me. But, um, and so the, for me, the idea of self-taping is, uh, it's, it's hell. It's just, you know, I don't like to be my own director. I don't like to be my own gaffer. I re and, you, and you have to be. You have to be proficient at, at lighting yourself. And I'm not. And, and uh, you know, but, but I do think what you say, for the younger people, I think they're used to it more. I agree. You know, they've been, they've been you know, their, their parents have been taping them since they were born. So they're more used to, and they've been taping themselves and each other all the time. And, and they, you know, I, I, I think it's more possible for them to be free and present and, and relaxed. But this is where it. they need your book. I mean, this is where, because it's like they're, they're, they're going to have to fashion. They're going to have to make choices. They're going to have to understand the scene. They're going to have to, what are the moments in the scene? What are the... You know, what's the turning point in the scene? How is my character affected by this? You know, that's, they, they can't ask questions. They can't find any of that out. So that's, it's, I think it's a time when, you know, actors are really, would do, be well served to really hone their craft in workshops or in studies with books like Judith's to really learn how to direct themselves. Because unfortunately, that's all I have to look at. It's like if, exactly. I look, if I look at a, a, a thumbnail, you know, it's like of someone talking, it's like seeing, I say, am I interested in them? Are they, first of all, do I find them authentic? Do I find them really existing in the circumstances or not? Uh, and then it's also very distracting when the person off camera reading is not good. And I'm thinking, okay, so they're having to deal with that and, and imagine a response that is different. Right. Tenor. They're, they're not, not getting they're receiving. the stimulation they need. So it's, it's not good. But, you know, it's like all, all I have at that point, you ask, what do I do? All I can do is respond to what's in front of me. Right. And if I see even a glimmer of something, you know, I, I might not have the same expectations that it be, you know, good stem to stern. You know, it's like the whole thing. I might see a moment. That's interesting. Let's because sometimes you can then call the agent and say, could they tape themselves again with an adjustment? Right. That that sometimes happens. Sure. But, but I think they have to have an objective. They have, they have to have something that they want from the other character in the scene. And, uh, and, and they have to commit to that, even if, even if the person that's reading with them is not giving them very much. Uh, but that goes to the saying about existing in the circumstances, because to exist is to have an objective. Yeah. 
you know, and right. it's like instead of to be and to act is not is not existing unless you are creating a character, and we all are, you know, everything we do is motivated, and so that's yeah. what they have to find. And sometimes it's not on the page. What is being described is not right. in the text, right. so it really does require that exploration and and exactly. uh, and under and it's so. One of the things I talked about at the very, actually we didn't talk about this today, but I talked about it with you privately, is a lot of what, ha, a lot of what this, these two books are collectively about is the constant friction between process and results. We are results oriented, but we have to continue to hypnotize ourselves that the correct process gets the results. Well, it's true and you cannot, you know, yes, you have to respect process because that's the only thing we have but you can't get precious about that you can't you know uh, I, I, when I was starting out a, a, a director who'd been doing a long time kind of shocked me <laughs> he was in an acting workshop and there were a lot of actors and uh, they were trying to direct and I remember one guy who worked a lot an actor and he was talking to the director who was teaching he says, no I know I know I know I know I know I shouldn't give result direction I know I shouldn't do that and this director said you know all I care about is results I mean, it's like, that's what my job is. I got to get the result on the page. Right. So, you know, it's like, that's a good splash of water in the face. It's like, you know, you can't, I mean, I found myself reflecting on it in the chapter I was writing about staging for the camp. Staging not, is not just a matter of getting the actors comfortable with it. It's also right. creating a staging where the camera can be in the pr correct position to give the audience the experience. Because if you just simply make, oh, is everybody comfortable? Yeah, I'm really comfortable. Okay, you're facing the wall. It's this far in front of you for all the scene. You know, I'm glad you're comfortable. We can't do it that way. Well, comfort is not the best because thing necessarily or, or anyway. It might even if it feels authentic to you. It's failed in its chief objective if I can't give the audience the experience of the moment. Well, well, that's why I think directing is just such, a, such an amazing, amazing profession because you, you are, you, you have to be able to step back. Is this working? Does this tell the story? Can it be captured? Can, can that story be told with a camera? And, but at the same time, you can go up to the actors and you can have moments of great intimacy, uh, emotional intimacy. And, and, I, and I was here reminding me too. It's like but, but, it, but it's two things. You have to go like a, like a rubber band back And you and know forth. what I find I do just instinctively is, uh, is I try to enlist always enlist the actors as, as collaborators with me and I share with them what the issues are. So I'll often appeal when I'm trying to move, uh, one of my uh, things often when I'm making, asking an actor to make an adjustment, I understand this may feel right to you, I'd like you to think about it a little differently because I don't think this is this moment in the story. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I'll talk about the story and they may be very wedded. I wrote a chapter on, an, uh, in the chapter on acting, I talk about in Homeland. You know how Mandy Patinkin had a you know choice that was very believable for his character, but it was completely wrong for the story and for the other two characters who had a certain reaction they needed to have to his performance. And I, I pointed out, you know, it's not his job to know how his choices are going to affect the other actors. That's my job as the director. Mm -hmm. And if it's and it's and it, if if it's taking the story somewhere else, then my job becomes how can I give him another intention or another way of thinking about the scene that also honors his integrity at the same time it preserves the story. Then I have to, and so it involved in this instance, which I write about, you know, sharing with him what, what the story point is at this moment, what needs to happen. And he fortunately, and he's a very instinctive, very method actor, and sometimes he can get very thrown by, by something changing what his instincts tell him. But because of the appeal to story, actors, you know, we're, we're all storytellers, every one of them are, including the actors. And it's like if you treat them as, yeah. as storytellers with you, and just acquaint them with the story you're telling, amazing things can happen. Well, I think that's the best way to, yeah. to talk to actors, especially uh, actors of great experience and uh, success and fame, is to talk about the emotional event. This is what the scene is about. It's not, about, it's not a confrontation. It's a, it's a, coming of, it's a, coming, a, a meeting of minds. And, and, and they, can un, you know, they can understand that and hear that. Mm -hmm better than if you say, well, I don't want you to be so angry. Right, right. But if, oh, you, okay. but if you say, it's, I, I, I don't, I, this is not a, and then you, then you have to tell them why it's not a confrontation. And then I would just add too, because I, I believe in this as well, is that when you want to, as a director, if you want to adjust an actor, it's very important that you, that the actor feels seen in what he or she has tried to do. Not just coming, no, 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 do it this way. It's like, 
to me, if when I'm mindful enough to stay present amid the stresses of the moment and the time and all that, I always try to say, I see how you played that, you know, trying to affect so-and-so this way. I'd like you to think about it a little differently. What if you think, so then suddenly the actor at least feels seen what they were trying to do. Okay, fine, you saw it. If that's not what the story, fine, I'm open. But if you just say, no, no, that's not it. You know, it can be dispiriting. Oh, that's, yeah, that's such a very bad, just I mean, no. not even, even, even without the brusque gesture I just made, just yeah. simply not registering that you saw anything. And that's the other really important thing for directors out there who may be watching and listening is, is you know, <laughs> actors are human beings. You know, directors who are don't, who, who, you know, complain about actors or who have never had, that's, acting experience gives you that sense like, yeah, that's... Or are afraid of actors. Or afraid of actors yes. because they have all the cliches. Right. I mean, I have a phrase in my book, it's like, you know, the people think that they, they run the, the cliches run the gamut from narcissistic to self-absorbed to this. I say, yeah, of course, they can be any of those things, just like directors, you know. But, you know, <laughs> there, we're all people and, and uh, you know, they have to be treated, they have to be seen, and then you can you have a chance of, of engaging them and getting their full participation. But, but I also like to tell directors that even if they uh, can't figure out what the actor is working on and it feels wrong to them, they can ask. Good, good, excellent. You yeah. could, you, as long as there's nobody else listening, as because long as there's nobody that, what, what's overhearing. What's so great, what's so it, it's, great. It's, as long as there's nobody else overhearing, you can take an actor aside and you can say, tell me what you're working on. You know, Judith, I have had experiences in my, in my working life where I have been so helped. I've been puzzled by something. I know oh, this isn't working. You know, I, you know, I think it should be this other way, but what were you working on? And what they're working on was such a more interesting issue. They just had chosen a solution to it in a way that Mm -hmm. Didn't think, but it's like they opened up something for me. Oh, that's fascinating. Why don't we try working let's on that on in that. a different yeah. way? Let's, let's build you on know, that. and that's that's when it's exciting. Yeah, that's when you and that's when you're really profiting from this. That's that's what this collaborative creativity affords yeah. occasionally. Yeah. yeah. So we're about to wrap this up. We've covered a lot of incredible uh, subjects in in ways that I. The beauty of this is that it was surprising to me. A lot of uh, there were a lot of surprises in here for me. How we all dovetailed and intersected with each other, but I want to just wrap it up and and give you each an opportunity to talk a little bit about your books, and where you're at right now with it. So Judith, start with you. I had the unique and amazing opportunity for a do-over, with the 25th anniversary edition. I wrote this book, directing actors in 1996, and put my whole heart into it. But I. And then I kept teaching. I'd been teaching six years at that time. And then I kept teaching for 25 more years. And I, I feel almost like a different person. I changed. I learned so much from my students. And, um, and I'd find they'd have questions. And I would say, gosh, I wish that was in the book, because I, now I know how to answer it. And so I, I, I feel like the luckiest person on earth, because I got to. Uh, rewrite directing actors and I think that the 25th anniversary edition I'm very very proud of it and I hope people will read it I, I have and I agree it's a it's a remarkable book and reflects your uh, your your wealth of experiences with a variety of very accomplished directors and actors I mean, Inaratus, I and mean, so many real luminaries cite you as the person who really gave them the tools to direct actors. And I think in this 25th anniversary book, it's, it's very clear why. So thank you for writing it. Thank you, Dan. And Dan, what about parting words about your book and what it means to you and what we can take from it? I didn't set out in my career to write a book. I wound up... Uh, a, you know, uh, mentoring a lot of young directors and in, in that process having to deconstruct my, what my process is, which was largely instinctive, but I, I you know, broke it down in a way that uh, seemed to be helpful to these young mentees. And uh, it occurred to me that I could reach more people in the same way as I reach individual mentees if I were to simply share my experience in directing and what, what always seems to me at issue. I wasn't interested in writing a how-to book because I don't think such a thing is possible. Right. Uh, I think really as a director, uh, when you approach something as a director, all you really have is yourself. And I think if there's an overriding 
theme of the book, it's that uh, really get to know yourself and really get to know what affects you because you are your own, probably your only real resource. I mean, it's, it's of course important to watch films, to, but in watching films and watching shows, notice what's impacting you. You said something in your book, you just reminded me of it, and I thought it was so profound that you, until you know your own story, your own narrative, you can't effectively well, tell other stories. Yeah. That is a very profound statement. It's something I talk about with actors all the time. Like what, who, I do an exercise about that because I think it's really important to self-knowledge and evolving in that. So that I, thought I, was, I took that from your book among many other great things, but that was beautiful. Well, thank you. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a subject that I've given a great deal of thought and, and consideration to all my life, is trying to figure out essentially who I am. Mm -hmm. Because I think that uh, narrative, we are narrative creatures, and we define ourselves in so many important ways by the stories we tell about who we are. And those stories aren't re generally chosen. I think they get formed in an instinctive way by the in the birth family, we come into this world around. We have certain roles vis-a-vis -vis other people. We were vulnerable, we're dependent, and how we, we know in an instinctive level how to survive. And out of that comes a story about who we are. And that's not truly who we are. It's how we survived. And so, so much of, I think, why we come to art and why we want to watch stories is we want to see possibly other stories. We want to see possible other uh, events, other, other, other uh, ways stories might unfold. And, uh, you know, I think if we can get ourselves, if we can get to reconsidering the stories we've told about ourselves, at least to even perceive them as stories, not reality, right. then we have a better chance of living a happier life. Um, so as a director, when I'm approaching uh, a story, it's not my story at the beginning, it's a story that someone has written. So my job, I feel, is to connect. How do I connect to it? How, because if I can't care about the story I'm telling, I don't believe I'm going to be able to make anybody else really care about it. So my job is to find my connection to it. And that's a deeply personal yeah. journey. And if I can't find a connection to it, I can't really tell the story well. So I'll work very hard to do that. And almost always, you know, stories are, will catch you in one way or another. And then, and then the job is to go deeper into it. But one thing that can get in the way is if you're not conscious of your own stories. Because sometimes the story you're tasked to tell is not that story. It's a story that is going to require you to break free of perhaps the limitations you surround yourselves, you set yourself with because you're out of self-protection. And for example, if, I, if, if a story wants to involve a, a, a confrontation with uh, 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 an authoritative abusive father, for example, and you and you have that in your own background, and you've never really faced it because you've never really acknowledged that's your story, and so you're living a life of of kind of making nice all the time. Right. How are you going to be able to encourage that actor? To, how, how are you going to be able to encourage that actor to or point that actor to what he or she has to explore, unless you can kind of make a distinction, unless you can know your story and either to make use of the insights it gives you or to know enough to set it aside and be an actor yourself in a sense, accept another inner life and be willing to explore that. Break free of the constrictions. You know, I think that's why we all come to art it's, and it's why, and it's, it's the frustrations I'm sure we all have as artists of any kind, actors, directors, whatever, you know, trying to uh, find freedom, trying to find greater depth, trying to not get stuck in the same you know, whirlpool of uh, unconscious drives and everything else. It's complicated because you also call upon those things to feed you, to give you new insights into things. But the more we can become self-aware, my belief anyway, is the, the, the greater possibilities we'll have to, to be artists. That's not to say everything has to be conscious, I mean, because that's another right. whole other subject. But I do believe the, uh, the, it's very valuable to, to look at your life as a story to see what story you're telling about yourself and to consider others. I, I always love to tell uh, uh, actors, the first thing about the character, ask yourself, what are three ways that I am like this character and three ways that I am not like this character? Because you have to explore all of those, start, start from there, and directors too, about every character. And the great thing about what we get to do, and what I didn't fully understand when I tried to be an actor, is it's all play. 
nothing's real. It's okay to break free from these inner constraints just for a little while. No one's going to die. No one's, no one's going to, there are going to be no consequences. It's just, it's just play. Even if it's a tragic play, it's, it's not reality. And that can be very freeing and enable us to kind of find depths of, of meaning and understanding that's aren't available, that it's not available to us elsewhere. The passion for storytelling. What a great, what a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.